This program is not intended to diagnose, cure, or treat any disease or disorder. The listener is encouraged to seek sound medical advice from their doctor or other qualified health care practitioner before taking any supplements or starting a new health regimen. And welcome to another edition of the Nutrition Heretic Podcast. I am Jim Dushar. I'm your co-host with my co-host, Adrian Hugh. Hello, Adrian. Hello, Jim. How are you today? I'm uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing just great. My uh, uh, my six year old informed me this morning that she's in a school play. Um, uh, she was asking about the uh, the groundhog and if you know about it seeing its shadow. And then when I told her how it works, she said, "Oh yeah, I'm in a play. I'm playing the groundhog." And I thought to myself, "Well, right now you got the teeth for it." <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> I just, you know, when I was, I think it's a move up to because she's playing the groundhog, groundhog number one. And when I was at school, I never got past tree or shrub. No, oh, well, there you see, each generation just just uh, incarnates this. That's right. <laughs> up the food chain. You know, in a thousand years, the Ducharme family will probably be on Broadway. There you go. There we go. So, um, look, we have a very interesting guest today. Uh, Kayla Daniel, uh, Dr. Kayla Daniel. Uh, yes, ha- she's also known as the naughty nutritionist. Yeah, so there's kind of a connection here, right? Yes, because she will be encouraging us to lose our veganity. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, the places, the places I could go with that. Just, <laughs> just thinking about that. Pete, you know, you could hear Kayla laughing in the background, but before we get to Dr. Daniel, we want to talk about a couple of things that sort of um, sort of in, uh, dovetail with with some of the things uh, Kayla's talking about, and uh, so what was this? Uh, you wanted yeah, to talk I, about. I started telling you. Of- yeah, I started telling you uh, uh, earlier, just before we got on the air, about this product that's been sweeping the nation called Soylent, and uh, you remember the last two podcasts we talked about my book Frenching Your Food, and my biggest gripe with food in America is that we hold so much disdain for food that uh, we often opt to not eat food. And this is precisely what happened to this young guy. I don't even remember his name, and I'm not going to go look it up now. But the guy who created Soylent apparently was, if if I remember correctly, he is a programmer of some sorts. And he got sick of having to stop, you know, every five or six hours to eat something. So he develops this recipe that enables him to keep working and keep sitting behind his computer without having to get up and fry an egg or just eat something sensible or, you know, pour water on a cup of soup it was apparently too much. So he, cre- he, he made this, uh, this concoction w- based on his, and I'm doing air quotes here, research into all of the nutrients that a human being needs to survive. He never came up with Twinkies? No, you know, they went out of business, didn't they? I, well, I don't know. I, mean, I, I used to live near Philly. That's the only reason that I know it? that. I, yeah. I, I, um, yeah, okay. So anyway, so yeah, so he develops this thing called, called uh, Soylent, and it's theoretically, it contains all of the nutrients that a human being needs to survive, and uh, you will be glad to know that, well, some people would be glad to know that it contains soy. Yes, uh, it's and so Kayla, green as people. <laughs> And as Kayla pointed out earlier, uh, it would be more nutritious if it actually contained people. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you know, it's interesting. Oh, and and yeah, you know, some people will be happy to know that they're working on a gluten-free version. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, Soylent, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that drives me nuts. And my personal experience with soy is that I, I suffered from hypothyroidism. And this is uh, thyroid month, National Thyroid Month in the U.S., and uh, so I thought it was it would be good to to talk with Kayla because she is the author of the whole soy story, the dark side of America's favorite health food, and uh, she n- knows about all of the damages that soy can do to the body. In my case, uh, my first looking back, my my first uh, inkling that something was going on with with my thyroid was uh, when I was in Spain. I was actually on a train, an overnight train from France to Spain. It was actually right around this time of year. It was January. And for some bloody reason, they had air conditioning on. And uh, when I woke up in the morning, my throat had just, it was, I had basically what I now realize was probably some form of goiter. 
And um, it was just, I mean, my my neck, it looked like a just like a big tree stump. Like my head just like went right into my shoulders. <laughs> it was horrible. So um, I at that point, I went to a doctor. He just gave me some antibiotics. Eventually, it calmed down and it went away. Uh, probably more on its own than anything else because, you know, they just back then and still some doctors today will just throw antibiotics at you no matter what. I was all of 19 years old. I didn't know any better. Um, but uh, over the years following that, I started to get uh, more and more lethargic. Uh, I always had issues with uh, eczema as a child, but usually it was contained to the winter months. I started to develop eczema year round. Uh, and it was so bad that my skin was cracked and bleeding. My my face literally had big peeling, you know, scabs coming off of it. And I started gaining weight, even though my diet was the politically correct diet, which, of course, contained lots of soy uh, and less meat. And we, I know we talked about that the last couple of weeks as well, that uh, most people, when they think they're going to get healthy, the first thing they, they think of cutting out is meat and you know because of course you know doritos are plant-based so those can't be bad for you uh so you know i went through a bunch of stuff and it took me years of therapy to heal my thyroid to heal uh so many things that failed in my body because my thyroid wasn't working properly and uh that's why i thought it would be fantastic and i'm so glad that she agreed to be with us today uh dr kayla daniel the naughty nutritionist would you please like to grace us with your presence. Sure. It's just such a pleasure to talk to a nutritional heretic. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to start off by saying a very curious thing about the Soylent product that's come on the marketplace, that there's no soy in it, that the soy in the name is meant to be kind of cheeky or ironic or amusing. (laughs) I I actually just went on their website and they say that, well, this is Soylent (laughs) 1.5. So I'm not, maybe you saw a different version of soy, but it does contain some soy. It's not soy based per se. Yeah, Um, I think it had a little soy lecithin, but you know, it's possible that I'm not completely up to date and there's more soy in it now that's 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 possible but also you know they don't necessarily make it that easy to find the ingredients of it it does almost strike me as a as a social experiment here because to call this food soylent knowing the you know the cult status of the word you know that the movie uh engendered i I wonder i mean is this just a, a big inside joke Well, partly. And, you know, all the marketing people they talk to all advise against using that word for all sorts of reasons, including the fact that most people don't willingly uh, desire to eat soy. But uh, they went forward with it. But one thing that's really interesting is, you know, compared to a lot of shakes and, and meal replacement ideas, it's actually more nutritious. So if you were in a horrible survival situation, it would not be a bad thing to have around. Interesting. But I just can't imagine replacing real meals with it because one of the great pleasures in my life is eating food. Absolutely. <laughs> And, you know, we use the word appetite to refer to, to food and also to sex, and it's it's a good thing. And I don't have any appetite for soy shakes or soylent uh, packages of food, even if they've got an S for Superman on it. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, you know, there's an element of hyper of hyper focus here that, that folks that, you know, if this guy's a coder, as as I think you you mentioned to me, Adrian, um, and he you know he spends as much of his time living in the virtual world as he does the real world. He you know there are people who think that way and 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 find that uh, the real world is really an imposition on that virtual world, and it's it's very psychological because it, you have total control depending on the situation in in virtual space. You right. don't. In, in the real world. So there is a, a number of, you know, percentage of people that prefer the virtual world because they don't need to eat. They don't need to do this. They don't need to do that. So it sounds as, to me as if his virtual world that he's spending a lot of time in is creeping out into his uh, real world existence. Yeah, I really just can't imagine it. I mean, I recommend to people real food, whole food, slow food, and to enjoy your food. That is so, so important. 
Yeah, it's it is it is baffling, and, and that's why I say that it it does disturb me that we we continue to see this trend of people who just have again so much disdain for the act of eating and the enjoyment and the community that that can bring to one's life. I just can't imagine uh, just eating packaged things, shakes and bars all day long. But, you know, a whole lot of people these days just feel they're so busy that that uh, there's an awful lot of shakes and bars and replacements and fast foods in their lives. Absolutely. And this has been something that's been coming for a lot longer than social media. I mean, people talk about pe- social media cocooning and, and separating people from other people. But, you know, we, we didn't start. Social media wasn't even a glint in the eye when we started building, you know, exchanging four foot high chain link fences in our backyards for eight foot tall cedar fences and and, and moving the front porch that everybody had on their home to the back. Right. You know, this has been an evolution, a human evolution where we've we've, you know, become started to wall ourselves off from each other. Absolutely. And uh, one day we'll, we'll go over the blue zones. Uh, but uh, um, that's, that's actually one of the things I liked about blue zones, uh, because they do talk about longevity rates and community and how people who live in uh, very tight knit communities who, to the point that they don't really even have hospitals uh, tend to live longer because of those human connections that they make. So mm-hmm. By removing real food from the equation, I think we're headed more towards uh, lowered uh, longevity uh, based on that concept. Uh, but I want to get back to uh, to uh, Kayla's expertise here with uh, soy. Uh, everybody, as, you know, as much as there are people now who understand the failings and the um, dark side, as you put it, of soy – uh, there's, I still meet people who try to impress me with their soy consumption. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what soy does particularly? I mean, I don't, I know it does many things throughout the, the human, um, systems. Uh, however, it's particularly with thyroid health, since we're focusing on thyroid month, can you talk a little bit about what it does? Sure. Well, soy has been heavily marketed as a health food, and I think you all know that, and more and more people are coming to realize this. But nonetheless, as you pointed out, there's still soy in a whole lot of foods, and in terms of supermarket foods, it's in more than 60% of processed and packaged foods, and it's in about 100% of, of fast foods. And you see it all over the health food stores, everything from soy milk to soy energy bars and shake powders and so forth. And then, of course, the veggie burgers and then um, old-fashioned soy products, too, like natto and tofu. And they're not so bad. I mean, I do enjoy some miso soup, but that's different than having soy with every meal in the form of processed, heavily processed, industrially processed um, meal replacement bars. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's more than 70 years of studies linking soy to health problems. And it starts with malnutrition, a whole lot of thyroid disorders, immune system breakdown, reproductive problems, everything from PMS to uh, menopausal problems mm-hmm. to infertility to loss of libido. Uh, so it can even cause contribute to heart disease and cancer. And that really shocks people because the marketing of soy has been that it prevents these these terrible health problems when in fact it can contribute to cancer and accelerate the growth of cancer. And it even contributes to arrhythmias and heart fibrillations and um, congestive heart failure. So let's not do it because it's healthy because it's not. Right. And you, you, in your book, you brought up a really, um, a, a really startling fact that I think might actually convince some people who still want to say, oh, just do a little in moderation. Uh, and, you know, still pouring the soy milk on their soy based cereal. Uh, that uh, the FDA has on their website, at least had on their website, a, what was it, 263 entries for soy in the 
poisonous plants database? Yeah, that's what's so funny. One arm of the FDA is telling us it's a health food and another arm is is putting soy in a poisonous plant database. You know, our tax dollars at work. Yeah. <laughs> and that number's <laughs> gone up since you wrote the book. <laughs> Uh, but uh, soy damaging the thyroid is one of the biggest reasons it's it actually works pretty well in animal food in the sense that they want to fatten those animals up and slow them down and turn them into food as quickly as possible if you're a factory farmer. Right. But is it is it soy itself, Kayla, or is it the way we're using soy? And I ask that because um, uh, tofu has been a, a, a staple in, in, in the Asian diet for quite a long time, has it not been? Uh, it has, and I will make a confession that may be shocking to people that I like a little tofu once in a while. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not talking about one slab, you know, one pound slabs of it at a time, and I'm not talking about having it every day. I'm talking about having it here and there. And the way it was traditionally used in all parts of Asia was uh, in moderation, truly in moderation, as a condiment in the diet and not as a staple food. So in Japan, you'd have a little tofu in some miso soup and there'd be some fish broth in there, too. And that's very, very different from how it's eaten in in the United States by health conscious people and by vegans who are using it as as meat and dairy replacements. Nobody traditionally in Asia was guzzling soy milk all day. Mm. And I would never say soy milk is the worst product out there. But, hey, I think it's the most dangerous because people who drink it are drinking it maybe for breakfast and maybe with their lunch and with their dinner. The the consumption can get quite high very quickly. And, uh, Skill, you had a, a really great line in your book of what uh, – I believe it was when they introduced – uh, the soy, I, I'm assuming tofu, for, uh, uh, for monks, uh, you said it was meat without a bone. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> Well, I think, um, you know, a lot of vegans and vegetarians like that image. And uh, to me, it's like having no backbone, having no no substance, no structure. <laughs> but it also, but it also uh, uh, reduced libido. <laughs> it does. You know, there's a little bit of naughtiness, you know, the meat without a bone, because in, in the Zen monasteries, the monks learned that uh, when the tofu consumption went up, the naughty behavior went down. Uh-huh. <laughs> So Which that's... totally flies in the face of this new uh, this new vegan pita commercial. Did you hear about this? Uh... I just heard about that, and it's so astonishing because the first thing you hear when people start consuming a lot of soy is they think they've gotten enlightened because they lose their sex drive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not where I come from. <laughs> uh, so many marriage jokes, so little time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, they say that Japanese uh, wives, if they have an unfaithful husband, will feed them extra servings of tofu. I, I guess that's <laughs> supposed to, uh, <laughs> you know, decrease the ability or the willingness or both. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, whoops. Okay, so what about uh, soy allergies and intolerances? Because right now the big for lack of a better uh, term, buzz phrase is gluten intolerance. Where does soy lie on the allergies, allergen scale right now? Yeah, that's a biggie, soy allergies. Uh, soy is now in the maybe as high as the top four allergens. Just a couple of years ago, it was in the top eight and before that in the top 11. So it's more and more soy allergies. As more and more people eat it. Yeah, yeah, as more and more people eat it and as it's in as it's found in more and more foods. I mean, they have it in things like uh, canned tuna. Mm-hmm. And years ago if people found soy in their canned tuna, they'd be really offended and feeling ripped off and now people are thinking, "Okay, well, as long as I can't taste it, I'm sure it's healthy for me." Right. And but that's the- funny you say that because back in the day when I used to eat McDonald's, uh I remember people complaining. This is like talking late 80s. People were like, "Did you know that 
And McDonald's hamburgers are 80% soy. And <laughs> now they're somehow they became 100% beef. I don't <laughs> I'm not sure that it's a different recipe, but I just think that's kind of funny that uh, back then, you know, people were like you said offended that that soy would have been replaced. Now they would uh, actually prefer yeah, and another reason there's so many soy allergies is the uh, GMO soybean came on the market in 1997-1998, and the, the allergies have increased greatly since the GMO have come in. Wow. Wow. So how do, the, how do uh, soy allergies and intolerances typically present themselves if people are wondering – what is this peculiar thing going on with them? Something that might might be able to say, oh, maybe I should read labels or eat food without labels. Well, the soy allergies are usually pretty easy to spot because people react to it very quickly. It's like a peanut allergy or another kind of allergy. Okay. Uh, so it could be anything from hives to, say, at worst, anaphylactic shock. Mm. And just to let your listeners know that many people who are allergic to peanuts should be very, very careful soy because some people have reacted all of a sudden severely to soy and there have been some deaths and they didn't initially know they were allergic to soy, but they had severe peanut allergies or they had asthma or there were a lot of asthma allergies in their family history. Mm -hmm. And um, those people are at extreme risk for soy. And there have been warnings in other countries, but in the United States, uh, people act as if it's perfectly fine to substitute soy butter for peanut butter, for example. Right. So just a warning there. Is is there a, a contamination with peanuts when it comes to the GMO soy? Well, there's a relationship to that for sure, including some just, but all along peanuts and soy are kissing cousins. You know, they're in the same family. Right. So, so take care. But the other kind of allergies, the more delayed allergies, uh, more and more people are responding to that too. And those are a little trickier to realize. And there's tests for it. Uh, in my practice, I often have people do food intolerance and sensitivity testing. And some people are able to determine what they don't do well with through food diaries. And the thing that's tricky is it's not immediate cause and effect, but exactly. after it could be a couple days or a few hours, there's a time lag. So maybe it's in a couple hours, you're feeling sleepier or just not feeling so good, or maybe it's a day or so later. So the intolerances and the sensitivity, they're harder to determine. Okay. Okay. So it's not, not, it's not necessarily like the diarrhea of a gluten intolerant person. No, in a way, if somebody has that kind of reaction, it's, it's a blessing. I know that seems hard to believe, but they, they know, they get the picture. <laughs> exactly. It's a very clear message. So the truth you, comes you out. Know, you know how to control it. At the <laughs> well, the truth comes out. Um, and the thing is, with the, the more delayed reactions uh, with soy, people will think soy is healthy. And if they have digestive upset from it and they have a tummy ache, they know. They say, soy's not for me. I'm not going to eat it. Those are the lucky people. Yeah. The ones who have the more delayed reactions are the ones who start out. And then over a period of a couple months, their thyroids starts to tank and go downhill most often into hypothyroidism with the symptoms of fatigue, lethargy, malaise, uh, loss of the beetle, thinning hair, etc. And then maybe they go to their doctors and they say, oh, you're middle-aged, what do you expect? And of course, a lot of middle-aged people do develop thyroid problems. And many people do not make that connection between soy and the thyroid. And uh, in terms of other problems, too, um, the stress on the pancreas, for example, that's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen because you went to, say, one vegetarian potluck and your pancreas got stressed out. But if that's going on day after day, month after month, uh, problems are quite likely to develop. Kayla, there's, okay. there's a lot of soy in desserts, right? Ice cream, frozen pies. Well, not the ice cream I eat. Um, there, there can be soy in most of the processed and packaged foods. 
So anything that's got an ingredient list, there might be soy in there. Okay. So watch out. If it's got a label, don't eat it. And and in terms of the thyroid, I, I don't believe you said this before. It's basically, is it just the goitrogenic factors that are blocking iodine uptake to the thyroid? Or is there something else that's going on there? Uh, there's a bunch of things. Um, iodine is part of the problem for sure. And we have an epidemic of iodine deficiency. It's gotten to the point with my clients where I'm doing a lot of iodine testing because it's so widespread. But with soy and the thyroid, uh, there is something in the soybean that blocks the enzymes that you need to make if you're going to make T3 and T4. And uh, we want to be making T3 and T4 properly. Otherwise, we're just not going to function well. Cool. And what's uh, so, Kayla, what's behind the the push for soy from you know from the food industry is i mean are we basically just are we always going to be stuck in this sort of repetitive cycle of uh you know and i i mean i don't want to sound like i'm overreacting by comparing them to the tobacco industry but you know this whole thing about um use this it's a new product you want to use this it'll do this this and this it's great it's better than this and then we start hearing tiny voices saying this is a problem there's problems with this we should be careful with this then those voices get louder and louder and louder. The industry pushes back because now they have a vested interest in in revenue that that you know people like you and Adrian and others are you know they see as a threat to. And then eventually, at some point, the government does get involved, but never does quite enough to really deal with the situation. Is are we just going to be stuck in this cycle, or are we ever going to get beyond that? Well, that's a really interesting question because the the products now that are marketed more to the health conscious people, the high end part of that market, they're they're actually saying no soy. So we're seeing shake powders now that are a whole lot of them are pea protein. Now, I don't think that's all that good either, but they're definitely trying to work the market that's aware that there's problems with soy. And another problem is there's a large group of the population that really is trying to avoid GMOs. So uh, most soy in the marketplace is GMO. So uh, I think a lot of manufacturers are thinking about substituting other things for the soy. And that doesn't mean they're substituting good products, but people are definitely thinking about it. Is that something that social media is playing a part in? Because now people can connect and... And, and share this information on their own? Well, social media is very interesting because uh, you can't just quiet people down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the things go viral. Don't I know it. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of it's inaccurate. I mean, all sorts of craziness ensues. And frankly, I get a little tired of some of the weird questions like I'm supposed to answer day after day after day. You know, that they read such and such on somebody, somebody's site. <laughs> But the the blessing is they really can't control the discussion anymore. Right, right. Um, I have to tell you, when I uh, was reading your book a little over 10 years ago, I was I was on a plane going to Spain and I'm sitting next to a woman who is about. 39 years old, if I remember correctly, but she, she was like at that age where she wanted to have a baby and couldn't have a baby. And uh, we were talking and I'm look, I'm reading your book. She's like, what's that? And I said, oh, it's all about soy, you know, that it's not a good uh, – uh, it, it's not the, the be all and end all that everybody thinks it is. And so we continue the conversation and she's tell, she starts telling me how she really wants to have a baby and she can't and she's been trying for years and time's running out and we're going – you know, we're talking and I said, you know, well, did you have a background in eating a lot of soy? Because, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the potential side effects of eating too much soy. And she, uh, she goes, no, I don't eat anything. You know, I eat – you know, when I want protein, I eat ham, I eat this, I eat that. So, you know – Fine, whatever. So, but it's funny because as I'm, as she's telling me what her doctor is saying about her, you know, luteinizing hormone levels and things, I'm reading the same exact text that corresponds in your book. And uh, so it's, you know, the middle of the night, everybody falls asleep. I wake up and she's staring at me. (laughs) She goes, Oh my God, I just remembered. When I was a child, she grew up in Argentina. She said, When I was a child, there was a product called Ades. A-D-E-S. 
and they used to give it to kids who were poor. And she goes, all I remembered is that all of the kids who ate that, who drank that stuff were fat, really fat. And I was one of those kids. The main ingredient of that product was soy. It was a soy milk product, or it is a soy milk product because I saw it a few years ago in Costa Rica. And that just floored me that something that she had uh, taken as a child now was haunting her, possibly haunting her in her late 30s. I've heard many, many stories like that, and there's a lot of infertility, and particularly among health-conscious women who are eating massive amounts of soy and who are also on a low-fat diet. Yep. I mean, that is a prescription for infertility, because Mother Nature designed us to have good fats and cholesterol and plenty of them, and if you look at cultures all over the world, you'll find sacred foods for fertility, and they are animal products that are rich in cholesterol and fat. And when people were experiencing famine or there wasn't enough food, they prioritized giving it to the, the, the women of childbearing age because they wanted and valued healthy children. So what do we got? People who are health conscious, but instead they're substituting soy, which is affecting their thyroid, which is affecting their cycles, which is affecting their fertility all adversely. And they're on low fat diets. There's, there's nothing there to make hormones with. So double trouble. Well, that is- right. So the, the body in its infinite wisdom is saying, don't have a kid now. That, Absolutely. You know, that's that's, you know, that's interesting. Survival. That's really interesting because, you know, when my, when my ex-wife was really keen on having a kid, we were having a lot of fondue. Okay. Yeah, well, and no. what was in your fondue? <laughs> cheese? Just, or oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Else? Yeah, cheese fondue. It was Swiss, <laughs> Swiss fondue, cheese fondue. So, I, you know, I kind of wonder. It's and, and, and fondue is associated, is at least I, uh, from what I know, with romance, correct? Yes, it's a very intimate meal for two, let's say. So is that, you know, think about it. Maybe it does have actually some, some you know, some roots in, in fact. Oh, yeah, I see what you I see now I see where you're going with this. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? He's talking about fondue, soy fondue? Oh, like, oh. You know, cheese fondue. Oh, I mean, I yeah, she was really yeah. big on the cheese fondue. That was a habit that was costing us 30 bucks a week. Mmm, I could eat 30 bucks of cheese a week. <laughs> well, I, I, I cannot imagine that you would have had vegan cheese fondue more than once. I know, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's no. So, Kayla, what what can people do if somebody's listening now and they suspect that, hey, you know, maybe I shouldn't have uh, you know, the the soy milk with a soy protein bagel and soy cheese and soy margarine on it. Uh, what what can they do if they want to minimize or reverse damage that they may have done to their thyroid? What is something that they can do to nourish the thyroid? Well, they may need to work with a health professional depending on how serious things are. And especially if, say, they were on soy formula as a baby or raised on a lot of soy milk and soy products because that's when the body and brain were developing and it can be very hard to reverse the damage during those critical time periods. But if, say, somebody as a grown-up decided to get healthy, decided to start drinking a lot of soy milk and eat soy energy bars and so forth. Uh, there's more hope. Um, you know, the longer they've been eating like that, the more difficult it's going to be to turn it around. And some of the people who decided to eat soy because they were health conscious were trying to reverse some problems. So there may have been problems in place before soy came in to exacerbate the problems. Exactly. So there may be some serious work to be done. But it would obviously start with uh, removing the soy from the diet. And the only easy way to remove the soy from the diet really is to stop using foods that are processed and packaged. So I say it only partly jokingly that we, if it's, 
And you know, people complain they don't have time to prepare meals from scratch. But I say, take the time that you spend reading labels and just get real food and prepare it. Absolutely. Or or the time that you spend, in the case of many people I know, the time they spend taking their kid to the doctor, waiting for prescriptions to be filled, it, you know, doing all of these, these, these uh, back-end fixes when they could have just made it spent 10 minutes longer in the kitchen. Now they got to spend four hours sitting in the doctor's office. To me, it's a no brainer. Yeah. And, and for me too, and I do enjoy being in the kitchen. I enjoy cooking. I enjoy eating. And for many people, it's getting back into the kitchen. Some people do not know how to even boil water today. Oh yeah. Well, I, I recently had someone uh, the other day complain to me that she was trying to. Uh, she all she wanted to do was nurture herself, and but then she said how much she hated cooking and she couldn't stay in the kitchen. And I said point blank, "How are you going to nurture yourself without preparing the food that you eat?" And you could hear a pin drop. You know, she was. <laughs> She was like, oh, I never really thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah, nurturing myself. Like, you know, what, what, is, what does nurturing constitute? What, what constitutes nurturing for you if it's not taking care of your very basics? And I, I think things like saying nurturing can often be a little bit of a crutch for a lot of people. It sounds nice. It sounds really nice to say that I nurture myself. But what, is that, what does that mean to you? Find a way. If you're not doing it through food, I want to know what you're doing that does – mean nurturing to you? I think a lot of people think cooking is harder than it is. And the reason they think cooking is so hard is because when people were pushing low fat food, it was very complicated making low fat food. So there was all sorts of stuff one had to do with spices and preparation to compensate for the lack of fat. Yes. But you know, cooking and salt. Good ingredients using salt and plenty of butter. I mean, you tell me a vegetable name and add butter and cook, and it's delicious. It's that simple. It really is. And and that's one thing that really stuns people when they go to places like Italy or China or France. The best food is just a scrambled egg sometimes. Absolutely. And, and there's a whole lot of basic foods that can be prepared very quickly and easily. Uh, with some of the clients I work with, I, I come up with the idea of, well, you know, master one new thing a week or, you know, even one a month. If it's even one a month at the end of, at the end of a year, you've got 12 new wonderful dishes. It's a Absolutely. start. Absolutely. So uh, people can find you at drkaylaDaniel.com and uh, that's D-R-K-A-A-Y-L-A-D-A-N-I-E-L.com. And you have a free report there called The Fats of Life. I do. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you take the good, and, you take the I bad. I just want to say I have dibs on being tootie. Yes. <laughs> 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 and Jim can be Mrs. Oh, Garrett. <laughs> I so want to be Mrs. Garrett, but <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, and and you also wrote another book that I, I neglected to mention, which is uh, Nourishing Broth. Uh, and you have a, a fabulous, uh, I guess, a primer on on the values of bone broth called uh, Be Super. And um, yeah, that can be found at nourishingbroth.com. Yes, I'm the co-author of that book with Sally Fallon Morell, and it's a bestseller. You know, broth has become very trendy, but there's nothing more nurturing or nourishing for us. Uh, learn how to make that good, simple bone broth. It's it's a powerful food. It really is, and it's a quick meal. I mean, you, what do you do? You throw bones in a pot with water, and then you come back 12 hours later or something? <laughs> how, how much easier can you get? Uh, uh, my mom used to... As a kid, she used to always uh, uh, use those powders and things because she, for whatever reason, had it in her head that there wasn't enough flavor coming out of the chicken itself, the, you know, the bones of the chicken. So one year, I, uh, after Thanksgiving, I took all the bones from her turkey and I threw it in a pot with water. This is before the, the, I even met Sally or, or you. I, I didn't know anything. All I knew was that I was cheap <laughs> and, I needed, and I needed to eat well. And so I, I boiled this up for her and I, she was left with, I don't know, a gallon of broth, which we froze in those like Chinese soup containers. 
And for the next month, she's every week she'd say, Adrian, I just made another soup out of the, the broth that you gave me. It makes it so much better than the stuff that I was buying. I don't know why I was wasting my money all that time. And it was so easy because all she had to do was take the broth, throw some vegetables, maybe a piece of meat in there, and she was done. Yeah, one of the the points I make in the Be Super booklet, which is free, uh, is that that broth really is a fast food. It's once you develop the habit, it's very, very quick, and you throw it in a slow cooker or a crock pot, and you can do it overnight, or you can do it all day while you're at work and not have to worry about it. And then you've got broth, which you can drink as, say, a meat tea, or you can add it to, you know, start it soups or stews or gravies there's just so many ways to use it and now that it's winter and cold it's just perfect i love using it to prepare my starch foods so if i'm having something like quinoa or wild rice or white rice for that matter uh of having that backbone of a good bone broth is fabulous it makes it taste really good and it adds more nutrition and it becomes more digestible Absolutely. And if it's a straight broth, you can actually fondue with it. Probably. No, okay. No, yes, you yeah. can. Yes, you can. The Chinese, the Chinese fondue. Yeah, it's a. That's they true. boil a broth and then you cook the. And then you stick your meats yeah. in there. Yeah, it's and, and it's probably a lot safer than oil. Yeah, when I was in Vietnam, I would see people uh, cooking out on the streets. You know, they had the broth going, and uh, when you wanted wanted your meal, they would add what was um, requested and finish it up for yeah. you. Yep. yep. F- fantastic. So um, you did want to mention, you, you told me just before we got on the air that you are now involved with a new foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I'm co-president of the Paleo Primal Price Foundation. Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we're bringing the real food communities together. So let's stop the arguing and the bickering about all the details and come together with what we share, which is a passion for real foods, whole foods, and slow foods. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and that's uh, Jim has heard me uh, many times say that even though I do believe that paleo primal diets are are a huge improvement over the vegan diets, mainly be, and vegetarian side of things, mainly because they focus on real food, uh, I do get worried sometimes that it, a lot of people fall back into that segregationist kind of mentality, where now they've just got to want everybody's got to one up each other. <laughs> and uh you know well, you don't eat this well i don't eat this you know so, <laughs> so uh, I, I think this is this is really nice to hear that this is going uh, uh in a more positive direction and it's really focusing on what's true which is that we need to just get back to basics we need to get back to uh, real things how do we find out more about this foundation uh, we have a website, uh, paleoprimalprice.com.org, uh, and uh, we just got started up in the fall, uh, so we'll be getting more out on that topic, and we're planning an event, another conference for, for next fall on the West Coast. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll put that we get this on the website. Okay. All right. We could do that. Awesome. We, we could definitely do that. So look, uh, speaking of the website, nutritionheretic.com is the website. Uh, just click on podcast. Uh, by the way, Adrian, have you hired anyone as your new virtual assistant yet? No, but I sifted through several, uh, several applicants this morning, just before we got on here. And uh, there were some duds, but there were some cool ones too. So, uh, you know, you can still keep, keep going to the careers page. And uh, fill out the application if you think that you have the stuff uh, that is uh, required to work with a heretic like me. And, uh, <laughs> and if you want to, if you want to catch us on Facebook, just search for Nutrition Heretic or go to Facebook.com/slash Nutrition Heretic. Uh, if you have a uh, suggestion for a show topic, a question, we love to answer questions on the show. Or if you would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us, and uh, we'll get you on here. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. Rate us, rate the podcast on iTunes. Kayla, did you have any finishing remarks that you'd like to uh, leave our listeners with today? 
Uh, I would recommend that people trust in Mother Nature's wisdom and be skeptical of Father Technology's contrivances and bright new ideas. Trust, trust in the ancestral wisdom. You I'm are so that. naughty. <laughs> I'm tweeting that right now. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for, for being our guest this week. I really Thank appreciate you. it and fabulous work. And I, I want to get you back on the show because you've been up to some really naughty things, girl. Uh, me? <laughs> girl. <laughs> well, that's my motto, to hot to handle. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Kayla. Thank you.